Welcome, curious minds out there. Tonight, we have the honor of having an interesting guest with us. He's a highly respected author, researcher, teacher, who peers into the depth of human consciousness and the uh, mysterious uh, mysteries of the universe. In 2000, Oliver began a transformative odyssey to Virginia, where he attended the highly acclaimed Gateway Voyage seminar at the Monroe Institute. Maybe he can tell us about that a little bit more. Uh, this key experience ignited a deeper passion for yoga in him, leading him to undertake formal training in Byron Bay, Australia the following year. Oliver began exploring the teachings of various traditions and became a certified yoga teacher, a journey that would take him across the globe, from the shores of Guatemala to the serene landscapes of Switzerland. Yeah. Oliver has uh, dedicated his life uh, to shedding light on the mysterious phenomena of out-of-body experiences and multidimensional consciousness. And through his books, workshops, and seminars, he empowers people to travel beyond the boundaries of the physical body and explore the limitless potential of their mind. Yeah. Oliver, thank you for being our guest tonight. Thanks for having me. I would like to give the floor to Brandon right away because I know that he has a fantastic and profound thought on the subject. Brandon. Uh, as as anything, right, it can be deep. There's a guy who walks around with a little fart machine in his pocket and he, he lets out these um, fake farts in uh, New York City. And even I can turn this so deep to see how pattern interruption it is for neural programming and to get oneself out of, pro you know what I mean? So, yes, dude, let's go deep on all of this stuff. So... Uh, there is a book uh, that I read this year, early on in the year, called The Unquiet Dead by Dr. Edith Fiore. Have you ever heard of this? Um, I've heard of it, but I haven't read it, I ha have to admit, unfortunately. I'm really interested in the in the way that people can be regressed, the way that people can feel that they have alternate storylines or that they've taken place in alternate galaxies at some point, or that there's even things that have happened to them in this physical reality that get repressed. Something I'm so fascinated about, about the consciousness itself, is how the phenomena, near-death experiences, and you perceive the world all sort of interplay together. And one of my main curiosities with this is why can we shut off? And this, this is something that I'm, I'm curious to at you, as somebody who sees from an out-of-body perspective, what happens in the consciousness of someone who has missing time, for someone who has something so traumatic that happens to them that they shut it off and then need, it needs to be brought up later. How does this also, and I know this is a lot, but this is one answer for you, and I know that. Uh, how does this also tie into screen memories? How does how does one is entity how are entities allegedly able to take and apprehend the way you see them physically? And multiple people sitting there see multiple things, owls or one of these things. So it all I think has to do with consciousness, like your ability to view, perceive, and be an active participant in this participatory reality. So what do you think of that? Oh, that's a lot. Uh, maybe you can uh, chunk it up for me um, and, and and start with like one question at a time. Fair uh, enough. Let's let's start with how screen memories occur in the contact phenomena. What do you think is going on with there? To where do you think it's the the entity's ability to control the way we see it, or is it our inability to see it for what it is, and we replace it with something as to preserve our own sanity? I, I think both is possible, but I tend to uh, go with the latter because um, I know for myself that um, I have so-called clickouts where during my out-of-body experiences, I'm being fed a chunk of information, for instance, and my brain is not able to handle it. It, it, it could be a very complex type of uh, data package, let's call it that. And um, the brain will just shut off and I find myself in a blackout. When I come to it, I know I haven't slept because sleep has a certain quality to it. And I'm very familiar with falling asleep and waking up from sleep. But um, Robert Monroe, uh, the founder of the Monroe Institute in Virginia, um, discovered this uh, phenomenon called, well, he called it click out. And, um, you know, it hasn't been explored in depth. There's certain theories, of course, that trainers uh, have come up with as to why they occur. But I believe that 
one reason could be the inability of the brain to handle such information at the time. So there's just a, a general shutdown, but there's also a self-protective um, modus, let's call it that, that could, you know, be necessary, uh, especially when it comes to re-traumatizing someone. You know, there are certain things that you that can occur during an out-of-body experience that might be able to trigger a trauma that is already in place. And I feel that there is some self-protection going on that the mind in this case knows how to shut off, you know, and to protect the, the viewer or the, 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 the person who's experiencing in that very moment, because not everything has to come into waking consciousness. And um, so I'm open for both theories, but I've also experienced during a recent hypnosis that there are entities indeed, you know, that do have an effect on our body mind system, not necessarily the soul part of it, uh, the actual consciousness, but our body mind system. And it can be deeply affected by other entities. Yeah, it's like sound plays a part in this. It's fascinating how almost fragile the human consciousness is and our ability to rem retain in control and sovereign, which which sort of that's what it's that's what's up for grabs here. These click out moments that you're talking about, that's terrifying, right? Blackouts people can say are alcohol induced, right? But let's say you're just walking along doing your thing and all of a sudden you hit a portal or you see an owl and then you're missing three hours. You're like, what the hell went on? Like that the brain would protect you in a way makes sense. Do you think though that that's to the advantage of the entity? I get in the immediacy, yes. But what I say is, is that it means that then on a societal level, they can do whatever they want essentially because we'll just sort of fear our way into compartmentalizing it or not saying anything or not doing anything or maybe we're physically incapable because uh, they know what they do to us, basically. Sort of a power that they're given. It's it's interesting. I'm just curious about your thoughts on this. Um, I just found you know, I'm trying to look at the at the larger reality system. You know, and I very much agree with uh, Thomas Kempel that the physical reality is is a simulation. You know, some kind of virtual reality, and consciousness as such uses this uh, physical reality to you know, gather experiences. So our physical bodies are mere avatars, you know, that are from an out of body perspective, oftentimes when I look at the back at the physical world, it looks like a hologram. It's not real, you know, I, I can, I, I sense and I feel and I see the non realness of the physical world and experiencing other realities are also tells me that there's, first of all, there's so many different types of reality systems out there, you know, possibly millions. And all of these are inhabited by different species, different entities, groups of entities, and humans are just one, one people, you know, it's just one, um, they're weak, you know, in, in comparison to other entities, I have to say they're weak. This whole projection, uh, um, I, I tend to look at it as 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 a as a movie almost from the out of body experience. You know, uh, from a non physical perspective, I'm looking at almost a, a three dimensional screen where things are playing out, and I can, I realize that that these avatars don't have powers without consciousness. You know, they're they're like they're puppets to consciousness, and they only have a certain lifespan, and some of them are weaker and some of them are stronger depending on their you know the way their system is is designed or is is maintained um and some people tend to get and i want to use the word attacked but they get bothered by different entities and other people don't and i i haven't found out why you know there, there, there's no clear pattern that shows me oh it's uh women between the ages of 17 and 25 maybe you know or guys between 75 and 85 no it's not that it's not clear to me as to why they attach themselves to certain individuals and not to others 
just so interesting because then free will is my question on that really the ultimate thing is free will like where does that come into place with something either being able to manipulate you from the outside or you just being able to hop in and out and really then it would be that free will is applies to you as your car it's just this is your car you know and it's just tricky to see that there are other realities for some people because not a lot of people spend as much time out of their body as you do and i'm fascinated by it i've never been out i just think it's interesting very cool daniel what do you think man Speechless. I was muted. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated. I've talked to Oliver before, and we had a, a long talk for my other podcast. And it's, uh, I still have to think about it now and then because uh, I really had a completely different view on all the things that he, Oliver's talking about. But uh, he changed my mind on some things. I want to ask you a question. When we started, you asked that in a certain state, you are your brain gets fed with some sort of data package. So can you explain that a little bit more? What, what do you mean when you say data package? What's what's within that package? Well, as you travel through, you know, different uh, realities or different reality sy systems, you encounter um, different entities and, and, you know, be it spirit guides or even what we call dead people or complete strangers that have nothing to do with our uh, surroundings here you know you might want to call them aliens although you know looking at the physical reality we're all aliens to someone um, and uh, here we use verbal communication as our means uh, of communication or written communication out there it's all telepathic it's all frequencies and the way data is being transmitted is much like you know, our data here online is transmitted from Germany to the United States. Uh, it's not verbal, uh, it's being translated uh, along the way. So sometimes I get clear signals that translate immediately into information that I can understand or can't understand, you know, that of course happens too. And sometimes the data, the amount of data is, is larger than, than my brain can handle uh, you know, it needs time to process and translate. It all has to be translated at the end of the day into something that is already within my frame of reference. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to understand. So, um, you know, they might send me a very complex set of uh, data, you know, and, and my brain is only able to take on so much and it'll translate whatever it can and the rest just uh, goes to waste which always, uh, you know, it's always a problem or a challenge because you never know when you get back from an out-of-body experience, it, was that all? Was that all that I have received? I'm generally open for the possibility that maybe a couple of days later, I'm receiving new information. I know it's already there, but it's being spit out by my system. And I might be at the grocery store, you know, shopping, and all of a sudden I'm getting flashing images or even uh, words or thoughts, you know, that are not mine. And I'm very well able to differentiate between my own thoughts and the thoughts that come in from somewhere else. And uh, it, it's actually kind of funny because you, you you might find yourself in a very weird situation. All of a sudden you have stuff appearing, you know, and uh, you got to deal with that that moment because it's there and you can't just push it away. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen all that often. Um, I find that it happens most often when the experience itself, the out-of-body experience itself is a prolonged one. Oftentimes they only last like a few minutes, but then once in a while I'll have an experience that lasts a lot longer. And, and those usually bring these click outs with them. Um, and then I know, you know, uh, something has been fed and I, I'll just wait, you know, days, sometimes weeks before the information appears. Well, that's interesting. Never heard the term click out before, to be honest. So, it's something very specific to the Monroe method. You know, Robert Monroe just came up with this uh, expression be for lack of better words, you know, because it was new to him as well. And he, as he started to work with people, people would experience these, these clickouts. you know, it was just a, 
a sharp cut uh, in awareness. And then all of a sudden they'd be back and they would have no idea that it actually happened. It's, it, it's just that from the outside perspective, you can see it because someone goes silent. Monroe worked with his explorers in a way that uh, he had them channel information. So they were, you know, on a bench or on a bed and, and, and there was a microphone and he would ask questions as they were going out of body and they would describe whatever was happening around them. And then all of a sudden they would go silent and nothing would happen. And then maybe five, 10 or 30 minutes later, they'd be back. Uh, it's, it, those clickouts in duration can be very short, but they can also be a half hour long. It's hmm. quite interesting. What do you think is occurring during the clickouts? Well, as I said, I don't know. I'm not conscious. I I, I can only guess. Um, and I, the way I perceive it is my hardware is not able to handle the amount of data, or it's something that is uh, where the self-protective modus goes on automatically, saying, you know, we don't need to experience this at this point because, well, I don't know why. Uh, there might be different reasons, you know. It's interesting. But it's it like could also, people, yeah. That say that they get stored information that will be useful later. It's almost like, yeah. okay, we need to physically let you experience the download of the information, but you don't have access to it. It's like locked files. You know, something's in there, but you don't have access. And then right. later on, it'll become useful, you know. Right. And not always, you know, as I said, because the our the way our brain translates uh, these non-physical data streams is much different from the processing of physical data streams. Yeah. What is your best tip for getting out of body? I've never had an out-of-body experience that I'm aware of. I'm not an experiencer that I'm aware of. UFOs don't don't hang out and not a not a high five and Bigfoot guy. How do you get out of body, man? I've got a lot of tips. I've tried them all. What are yours? Please get me out of the body so I can fly around with you all and have some fun. Just do it. <laughs> it really comes down to, uh, you know, allowing yourself to do it. I think a lot of people look at the phenomenon um, and, and and have certain expectations. And, and that, again, blocks uh, us from having these type of experiences. Um each individual has to go their own path. You know, there is no one tip or one uh, piece of advice that I can give because I need to know the person. When I teach these things in, in workshops, you know, I look at every single person closely and see, you know, where are they at in life? What have they brought with them? You know, what's the baggage they carry? A lot of times it's um, subconscious fears that they haven't dealt with or trauma could also be the case. Um, uh, or they're in general carrying belief systems that are counterproductive, you know, that are not serving the purpose. So there's a lot of cleanup uh, involved that, you know, I, I take people through. And then we start uh, doing exercises that allow us to understand our multidimensional self a little better. And I think that's also a key um, for, we're raised... Uh, to believe that we are physical matter, you know, that that our essence is somehow stuck in our head or in our body. Um, and it took me a number of years to realize that that's not the case. A human doesn't have a soul. The soul has a human. Consciousness um, does not reside inside the body, but the body resides in consciousness you know it's all the other way around so we gotta figure out a way to change that belief and that conditioning that we we've uh come to accept um because we were brought up that way that's what we're being told that's what we are being taught and it, it, it some people realize it early on in the process and others um will never realize it because the belief is so strong that there's no way out Today, looking back at all the efforts I've made, and it took me a number of years to really get to the point where I could um, astral travel at will. And, and even today, I can't just lay down on my bed and say, I'm going on a, I'm going to astral travel tonight. You know, it, it, it has to be, I feel it. You know, I can feel it when I'm healthy, when I'm strong, when I'm well balanced. I have no problem getting into the out of body state. 
but it's actually not that there is something leaving the body and we're made to believe that that's the case you know consciousness is and the body is a mere avatar being used by consciousness and uh all i have to do is really withdraw um my my true self from the physical sensory input and once i get there i'm 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 fully out of body anyways you know but i'm just trying to push uh the the button the stop button on all the physical senses that's really what i'm doing it's the most fascinating perspective i've ever heard when it comes to this because yes it is even even with all the disciplines we have to say oh no i'm not my body i'm bigger than this and there are multi-level bodies the way that you put it was so interesting because now it's just this I, and and again, it it ties together all the things that we're just like, yeah, that's the case. We're vessels, you know, or vessels rather. We uh, Grays talk about that we're vessels and just souls driving these things around and all these things, like what you say. But man, to think of it like it's just filling this part of the container for a little while. But what you're doing really to get out of body is remembering that all you're doing is filling a container over here to use it for a while. And right now it's asleep and you don't need it. Or right now you've given it permission to go do something else. And then that withdraws back into yourself. And so what you're doing is exploring the withdrawing back in. That's fascinating. What an outstanding perspective. I'll never look at it the same, man. Thank you, Oliver. Wow. Oh, you're welcome. You know, not too long ago, I've talked to a friend. We talked about out-of-body experiences, astral travel, stuff like that. He said, don't try, don't go there. We don't belong there. What you think? Oh, I, 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 we are multidimensional beings, you know, it's, we don't belong here at the end of the day, you know, that's, <laughs> we're here for a limited amount of time, but it's not our home, you know, and a lot of people can feel that from, from day one, I was one of these people, I always felt like a stranger in my family, in my surroundings, in my world, you know, I was never fully integrated. Even today, I have difficulties accepting this mission uh, that I'm on because I feel my other layers. And I know that there's other parts of my total self that have incarnated in other places, you know, parallel to uh, what what this uh, part of my soul is experiencing now. And I, I like to go out and explore these other parts of myself because it gives me a sense of belonging. You know, I'm not alone. Uh, here, I, I always feel isolated and misunderstood. Um, and it's not easy to deal with. But I, you know, to answer the question, um, we belong out there. You know, our soul is out there. So yeah. uh, I, there, there's definitely a reason why we have incarnated, you know, each and every one of us, that there's a free will choice behind that. Um, and you don't want to get lost in in just going out of body. And I've met people who've who've done that. And they're not functioning well anymore in the physical environment because they spend so much time out there that it becomes hard for them to find their footing here to ground. Uh, so it has to be a balance, you know. And I'm I'm always told by by entities when I go out there uh, while I'm exploring that not every door will open for me, you know. That there's things that I'm not supposed to see, learn because my capacity is 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 that of a p you know i'm uh i'm nothing uh i'm so limited with my hard drive here it, it's so slow in processing and a lot of times when i'm asking questions out there when i'm trying to explore something they're just shaking their heads and saying you know don't even try your yeah. little p brain is not going to comprehend anyway so don't waste your time here you know do you think that's limiting? Do you think that's true? If you're a multidimensional being, couldn't you just as easily be able to process information in this body multidimensionally? I'm not Bridge sure because we 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 have that challenge, you know, that we we're, we're dealing with this hard drive, you know, and and uh, as long as we try to bring that information into physical reality and to you know for reasons of expression, th there always be that challenge you know non-physical information and then brain and brain is just not very functional you know and uh it's it's enough for to to navigate the physical plane but uh all the stuff that's out there man 
I, I don't even want to know, you know. Uh, I, I feel that I've just scratched the tip of the iceberg, really, with my explorations. And I've been out there for 24 years. So uh, still, I'm, I'm at the beginning. Uh, anybody worth their shit says that right there, that they're just at the beginning, even though they've got 24 years under their belt, man. That's awesome. Yeah. That makes me respect, just respect you more like you needed it. But I think it's interesting when you start to consider this idea of limitations brought upon, brought upon us, even in other realms, because it's fantastic. It's awesome. And you may get some amazing feelings out there, but at a level, there may still be a motive that's imparted on you to play a role here, but that also may be an opportunity. Like what, Morpheus tells Neo in the Matrix, some rules are meant to be bent, some are some to be broken. Maybe that's one of those rules, and you can actually upgrade this with the alchemy you have. Maybe that's leftover junk is just to bridge that gap and make you like some super mind where you can really get some telepathy going here. You float around the house, you know? It'd be awesome. It would be. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, I'll ever achieve that, but, you know, I'm I'm going to cast sure the chains trying. of limitations <laughs> off of you, my friend, and I'm going to go ahead and put you in the category of the guy that will figure it out boldly and confidently as the one that should receive it. What do you think about that? What do you think about superpowers here? What do you think about uh, flying around and, and all of that? Because really what we're talking about with this great revealing this time of enlightenment is the shedding of limitations like we're just talking about here. Do you think this place is capable of us being able to consciously shed the limitations that we can't fly to where we can? Um, can are you talking about flying in the physical Physically, body? Yeah, like I go, hey man, let's go for a fly instead of a walk, and we just glide over somewhere, you know? Limitation. Uh, levitation, levitation yeah. bro. The, yeah. Well, Maybe levitation is, is is a point. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to master that to that degree anytime soon. I know that we're mastering other things, you know, such as telepathy uh, or even remote viewing. You know, it's become such a popular uh, thing to study and to do, and it's so useful in the physical world. Um, so I, I, th I think, you know, humans are evolving at a speed that we haven't seen before. There's a lot more people that have the ability to... Um, well, yeah, they're clairvoyant or clear audience. You know, they they perceive a larger reality within this reality. You know, look at, at dogs, for example. My dog, when I take her out for a walk, she will sit down somewhere just randomly. And I don't understand why she sits down. You know, I had to learn her language. Around the corner is something that I can perceive. My dog perceives it already way ahead of me doesn't mean it's not there but just because I don't perceive it it just means that you know I'm more limited than my little poodle and that's um that tells me something this is interesting because I just read Exo Vaticana by Thomas Putnam and uh or excuse me Chris Putnam and Thomas Horn this thick book here if you guys have never read it or heard of it I highly recommend it it's it's an incredible book what they talk about in there is sort of this idea of chimeras and, and utilizing the animal world and its senses in a way that can benefit humanity. And this is where you start getting into genetic manipulation and all that. What right. do you think of that? What do you think about integrating animal senses into human perception? Do you think it's supposed to happen? Do you think it's natural? Do you think we should be doing it? Or is it one of those Jurassic Park things they didn't ask if they should, you know, kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we should. Um, I don't think it'll help. Uh, humanity you know I don't I don't see the benefit sometimes I just want to go back to the 50s you know where we didn't have all that technology and the involvement and, and whatnot because it, things were a lot easier and more enjoyable um, so I'm not sure I'm a little bit on the fence uh, about these type of things but I uh, you know genetic manipulation will get us there eventually you know it's without a doubt I mean they've been experimenting with it look at the sheep you know uh, what was her name Dolly you know it took them a few years and all of a sudden they were able to clone a sheep uh, and that that's yeah, the way uh, well, you look at as well just the augmentation going on with this transhumanism occurring with this integration of machine and mind and then what that does is you know morality we can just talk about but what's really interesting about that is is those type of adaptations features or senses could be integrated in there somehow to where they'd be like hey you see like a giraffe at night and you're like sweet and you get like 30 high up vision but there'd be interesting ways to correlate that right so it'd be more tied to a neural network and it would mimic those senses in a sense reading off right. of one another but it would be an interesting it would be an interesting selling point for the features, right? To be able to have predator vision at night or something like that. 
That'd be pretty cool. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just not sure how it would serve humanity, you know, if, if we were all becoming so transparent. I mean, we already are to a certain extent, you know, but with everybody having super senses, you, you, you wouldn't be able to hide anything anymore. I, I just did an interview with uh, a lady in Germany here, and she's, I mean, she's so brilliant in, in, in her percept, her perception is, is just outstanding. And, you know, when she looks at you, she doesn't look you in the eye. She looks at your energy field and she just starts talking and it's scary as hell. You know, I'm thinking she's not from this planet. Definitely not. Um, and I've met a few people like that where I intuitively knew they're not from this planet. You know, they've just chosen to be here for whatever reason, but they're not my people. Or I'm just too primitive, you know, for this kind of uh, stuff. Man. man, that's so interesting, man. So since my hard drive is also slow, I I can't get it out of my head. Everything we talked about so far. So you're saying there is, in fact, an independent existence beyond our physical existence, right? Independent in what sense? Do we need to be here? Oh, no, we don't need to be here. This is just a playground, you know, for uh, for the for the larger consciousness system at the end of the day. You know, the larger consciousness or great consciousness, whatever you want to call it, uh, made that choice to uh, manifest itself and uh, in, in, into smaller units of consciousness. And um, Thomas Campbell would say it's, it's part of a greater evolutionary process. And I would agree for lack of a better concept. I think his uh, big theory of everything is is pretty much the best we have these days. You know, he's got a vast background of out of body travel. At the same time, he was a he was a physicist his entire life, and uh, he has a lot of knowledge as to how things could possibly be. Uh, orchestrated and a lot of my experiences that that I've had and that I haven't been able to understand fit into his mold you know and that shows me that he's really onto something with his uh his theory yeah I was just curious we were talking about how how awesome it is over there and but still we come back every time we still come back and, and and you said it you said it before sometimes we, we feel like we don't belong here we don't feel loved we experience bad things sometimes some people experience very bad things but still we come back here every time after our awesome astral travel or after our awesome out of body experience and whatnot so this is the part that makes me think well, let me tell you, I'm I'm working on it. You know, I'm working on it. This is my life goal that one day I can just say I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here. You know, this is it. I'm just gonna stay here. I'm not coming back. I think you know we have to look at the reasons as to why we came here in the first place. You know, why did this unit of consciousness uh, or unit of awareness incarnate into this body at this time? into this reality, there's, there's got to be some kind of a valid reason. Um, and there's definitely some kind of, I don't want to call it force, but, you know, there's rules, I guess, uh, to, to that, that keep us from just exiting at, at uh, you know, whenever we want. People exit from this reality all the time. My dad just did that a few weeks ago. He shot himself. And it was a very conscious decision, you know, and uh, I don't know what his motives were. You know, we, I'll never find out until I talk to him again, I guess. But uh, he just had it, I guess, you know, he just wanted to leave. And I don't blame him. What keeps us here is is our genetics. We have fears that have been engraved into our genetic makeup. You know, we are born with a fear of heights. We are born with a fear of loud noises just to be able to survive in this environment. Most other fears are conditioned, but you know, there is a fear. People fear death. If they wouldn't fear death, they'd be done, you know, <laughs> most of them anyways, you know. Um yeah. 
you know where I'm going with this now, Daniel. So I'm curious about the dark entity side of this stuff that you've encountered or to the that could answer the question that maybe we don't want to be answered this way, that perhaps the Gnostics and the Cathars got it right with their idea that this is a carbon copy demiurge reality where the soul reincarnation is actually a trap. And whenever you come back here, your memory wipe is posed in the in the thought that, oh, your consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And then at some point in that, you know, point of the memory wipe, when you start to relearn, you start to go, well, hang on, why does life need to know rape and suicide and things like that constantly? Like, why does consciousness want to tap into that reality all the time? Then it starts to look a bit more Westworld. Then it starts to look a bit more Westworld, where only the billionaires, these nasty people who run the elite, get to get in and get access to. And then we start to feel the like the participants in that environment. And then again, this idea of a soul trap uh, reincarnation cycle is a dark path, man. It's a dark way to see this place. So I'm curious if you've taken that path, if you looked at it in that direction, because it sort of plugs in a lot of the atrocities and things like that, but it's not as fun. It's definitely not as fun, I'll tell you that. What do you think of that to the people that feel this is a prison planet, soul trap, whatever? I don't buy it, to tell you the truth. You know, I've, no, I've not found a single indicator that tells me that that's actually true. Um, again, that's just my perspective. That's just my experience. And I can only talk for myself, but I can also talk for those who've gone before me, you know, um, and, and that will include Robert Monroe or uh, William Buhlmann, um, especially Jürgen Zewi, um, the German explorer that has been living in uh, Great Britain for many, many years. And he's uh, documented his experiences to greatest detail and has written a number of books about it. And I'm always um, surprised, you know, how similar a lot of our experiences are, which shows me I'm not making stuff up. You know, I can actually relate to other people's experiences. And none of these people have ever witnessed or found anything that indicates that this is just a trap. I think it's a it's an excuse, you know, for people who don't want to take responsibility. Um, we've, I think, we're free will units. You know, there might be certain limitations that we're not able to um, get across. Uh, but in general, the way I experience the afterlife and even things be beyond the afterlife don't indicate that 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 it's all um, just a big scam, you know, that it's being forced on us. One of the most interesting thoughts that it is a scam from some people, and this is just the side I'm just talking to and about here, would be the people who say that even the next level of this, while you're at a body, yeah. all of mm -hmm. its manufacture a bull, even the sensation that what you're feeling is awesome and great, or that this place is, it's just sort of next level gatekeeping that then you're able to come back and then tell the vast majority of us, y'all being a very small percentage of people who can participate in this, then you have insider info that most of us don't. And when you come back, you disseminate that info as truth. A lot of this happens as well in near-death experiences. They'll have a near-death experience, change their life completely. And then what happens? They start saying, go to the light, everybody, go to the light. Well, this is good for business as far as a reincarnation trap goes. And just philosophically, if you could look at it that way, you could see how it plugs in and why logically. Like if you take all feeling out of it, because it doesn't feel good to look at this. But if you take all logic into it as a system, it functions perfectly. Absolutely perfectly, because you're unaware. Love can be manufactured. Hope can be manufactured. Anybody who's taken MDMA or ecstasy knows, or scopolamine, you know that that's a very real thing that you can be chemically altered to feel and therefore make decisions based on that directive. Right. But it's, it's right. not of you. And so then, therefore, one could say it's scalable, right, as above, so below. So why wouldn't that apply at the next level? Why wouldn't there be another level of deception? You know, I'm just curious if you've thought about it. I, I've, I have thought about it, but it doesn't serve me, you know, and uh, I began questioning the light trap because it's become such a phenomenon over the past few years and everybody's talking about it. It, was, it has never been an issue in, in, in the 70s or 80s or 90s. Nobody ever talked about the light trap, you know, and all of a sudden someone comes up with this theory and everybody jumps on the bandwagon. And uh, so the light is not an actual light. You know, when you experience the light it is a process of, it's more like a fog. You're changing frequency. You're leaving the physical environment and you, you're coming to, to one of those thresholds where you need a new vibration in order to be able to travel more further, you know, in order to, to, to jump the, the fence, so to say. 
And, um, you know, in yoga, we would say we're, we're, we're switching into a, one of the other energy bodies because they have, they are of a different vibration. So whatever is being perceived as light, um, is not an actual light. It's, it's, it's just the closest we can come up with, with our translation, because it feels light, uh, but there's not nobody that has a switch. There's no sun, you know, there's no light. Um, it is a state of mind. And once you've come to a, another level of uh, vibration, you know, you experience differently and the environment changes and it's the next level up in the video game, so to say. And then there's the next light and then there's the next light, but none of this is light really. It's, it's vibration, it's frequency. So the the plan that these people uh, have, you know, to when they say don't go to the light, where are they going to go? They're going to stay in the lower astral world, essentially. They're not going to be able to ascend um, because there's no way around the light. It's it's we're beyond time and space as we know it here. So there's no there's no road signs that tell you, you know, don't don't go through the light. Where where else are you going to go? You know, you're either going up in your vibratory level or you're going down or you stay where you are, like many do after death. You know, they're not able to move on because they refuse to or they can't. They're not aware they're dead. But I don't see the point of uh, even talking about a light trap when there's no actual light. So that's the main thing reported by people when they come back. Hey, go to the light, go to the light, go to yeah, the light. Like yeah, it's yeah, because reported. it appears. Now, whether it's perceived incorrectly, but that's how it's yeah. phrased. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's perceived incorrectly. I'm I'm gotcha. I'm I'm 100 percent sure uh, that that's the case. Yeah, now, such as the tunnel. You know, the tunnel is not a tunnel. It's an energy field of a certain quality. It feels like a tunnel because it has a certain density. To me, it's almost like I'm jumping into a huge bucket of um, of ink you know, dark ink and it, and, and it surrounds me and it feels, I can see the, the, uh, you know, that people would describe a tunnel, but they're actually moving through a certain energy and then they're getting to a different vibratory level and, and see or feel the light. It's interesting. Like I said, not a fun perspective. Cathars, Gnostics, they talked about this, man. It's not fun. Nobody wants to sit here and think that we're the product of Sophia's demiurge. It's just, kick it about and we're in some sort of soul trap and then that calls into question why we're here right like how can we get out and all of these kind of things and i don't again agree with you that it's a valuable use of your time but it may be you know just an interesting light to show that direction if you can stomach it man but it's it's tough it really is plus we we also have to ask ourselves who is that me or you that we talk about you know once you you leave the physical world ego is going to shrink tremendously it's not going to be dissolved immediately after death but since you're gaining a larger perspective, you're usually, not everybody, but for, I, I want to say maybe, I don't know, I can't say a percentage, but the, the largest part of souls that exit this world, they uh, have an immediate expansion of awareness. At the same time, ego will shrink. And there, you know, this is all ego stuff that we're talking about, fears, what could be, what, you know, all these, it's, it's just pure ego stuff. And I don't like to spend too much time dealing with that because ego is evil. You know, ego does serve me in this reality a little bit, but for the most part, it's just annoying. It's the reason why you guys can't go out of body because the ego is is keeping you back, you know, and, and ego makes up stuff. Uh, so the, the real trap here is ego and not the system, I believe. Yeah, consistent revealing by the phenomena, whatever it is. I think the consistent inconsistency is why it's not trusted by folks who have a tough, who have trust issues. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, man. Right. So yeah, maybe that's it. We just have trust issues, Daniel. That's why we can't get out of body. That's fine. I've heard also of people saying things can mess with your body while you're out of it, and then you're saying maybe that that's not true. Is that right? Mm, I think. Well, it's 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 tricky, you know, and I think it's more complex than we think it is. I don't believe that anybody will take over my body while I'm out because I'm not out to, I'm, I'm out all the time. You know, the body is my playground and my higher self, my soul, whatever the, the that instance is, the next level up, uh, 
uses this body. It's not a decision that my ego makes. You know, my ego is not in charge. My ego is just an annoying little chihuahua in this whole game. Uh, but my higher self, my larger self is the one that makes decisions. And I'm this unit of consciousness might not be aware of all the decisions, definitely not. Um, and is, is, is only partially involved in the whole process. Uh, but there, I've witnessed things where, um, I want to use the proper word, it's not so much that someone's taken over your body, but depending on how what your belief system is and and the way you live your life you know you're attracting certain energies and those might feel welcome in your energy field and those could be of a let's say lower nature you know non-intelligent entities uh or uh trash you know yeah, like demons <laughs> or something right yeah well i i'm not a friend of the word demon because it's being misused in in our language uh but there's definitely entities that are on they're low intelligence entities you know that will attach to certain people because they find resonance in that field and i witnessed that a lot in people that consume drugs on a regular basis or alcoholics or um you know people of that nature because they lower their frequency enough for these other entities to feel attracted they will uh these entities will leave because when you uh when your frequency goes up again there's nothing they can hold on to but what we do have and i learned that the hard way myself is um i i i had a um hypnosis session recently with a lady that deals with these type of phenomena and she went out uh you know exploring my system and and, and we actually found an entity that had attached itself to this whatever i am you know in this life uh at the age of four years old and it it in during hypnosis i channeled this entity and it explained that uh, the only disadvantage for me is that my memory is not working 100% in this life. But other than that, uh, it's not causing any physical harm. Although this could be a big lie. You know, we don't know. This is what the entity said. It could be a big lie. I've never felt unwell. I'm generally healthy, extremely healthy. You know, I'm almost 60 and I have no aches and pains. I'm in really good shape. Is it harming me? I don't know. But it was definitely there, you know, because it spoke through me and it it, it it surprised the hell out of me. It wasn't scary, but it it was really, it came as a surprise because I wasn't expecting it. Um, so there's definitely stuff out there that, that we need to be aware of. I'm not sure um, to what extent they're able to manipulate us. Yeah, but, yeah I'd say, I just the, have a few more part. questions on that before I hop out of body then. We'll just get that sorted at a level. You report back to us. Let me know when you guys get that biff sorted where I know nothing's going to be implanted in me or take me over or say something mean to my wife that I don't mean, you know, while I'm not around or something like that, that kind of thing. Like I'm not, I'm not into that. So yeah, that, that's a bit of apprehension on my part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've talked I'm to President Dennett. Yeah. We've talked about President Dennett, uh, with President ben Dennett about uh, the topic and he's out of body all the time, man. He's out of body all the time or astral travels all the time. Love goes out, President Dennett. Love you. And yeah, can you guys meet together? Oliver, do you yeah. guys do that? Do you plan for to meet in astral spaces and stuff like that? I've actually done that with a friend for a couple of years. We've done team explorations and uh, it, it, it only works to a certain extent, you know, because much as in this reality, you always create your own reality. Your, and then realities begin to overlap. So we had a lot of uh, mutual experiences where the data we received was similar, but then on other days, it just wouldn't work out as well. You know, at the end of the day, we were able to collect a lot of valuable stuff. But then again, we're both humans. So we're limited in that. Uh, it would be much more fun to do partner explorations with someone who's not from this planet, you know, with an alien. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. We talk. We've talked uh, to President Dennett about uh, what you just uh, talked about. Um, when you go out of body, and your body is unprotected. So could it be 
possible that your body is taken over by some kind of entity or demons or whatever you want to call it. I'm thinking there are people out there that claim that uh, they need an exorcist because their uh, body they're was possessed. Yeah, they're possessed by by demons, yeah. bad entities, and they were weren't out of body. You know what I mean? So when you're out of yeah. body, you're you have an unprotected shell. People talk about this, the silver cord and stuff like that, but I mean. I'm not sure about the, that, man. The shell is never protected. You know, you gotta you gotta rethink this whole thing about the shell. The shell is a manifestation of consciousness. You know, and all these entities out there are also part of the larger consciousness system. Whatever you attract in your energy field is able to you know attach to yourself, and uh, th those can also be beneficial entities. You know, that come in with a very creative force. Um, and bring through very excellent and, and great stuff. It's not all evil, but it depends on, on the person and the belief system that person carries and the way that person lives his life, the, the kind of resonance there is for, for these type of entities. And, uh, you know, when you talk about exorcism, I, you know, had, had you told me that three months ago, I would have probably said, uh-uh, it's not part of my experience, but since I've done this hypnosis session, since I've talked to a bunch of people who've been through the same kind of work, I've watched a lot of video material um, for, that the practitioner showed me. And what she does is actually exorcism. You know, it is exorcism. It's not religious exorcisms, uh, but the, it definitely is. She's freeing um, energies from someone's energy field. A lot of these entities though, and, and she claims, and I, I can only repeat what she says, is eight out of 10 are so-called IPs, incarnation personalities of your own um, uh, reincarnation cycles. You know, an aspect of your soul that's gotten stuck and it attaches to yourself for various reasons. So they're, they're not strange entities that are actually parts of yourself that have lived before and they're unable to go to the next vibratory level. Um, but then there's these other 20% that are strangers. And in my case, it, it, it turned out to be a stranger. It was not an IP. Uh, so I, I found that a little bit worrisome, but at the end of the day, you know, what can I do? Um, uh, she she was able to detach it from my system i'm not sure if that's gonna gonna be lasting or maybe that thing will come back i don't know uh, and I'm, I'm intending to explore this uh further because i find it highly fascinating do you think that there are in fact entities out there that have a hmm. do you think entities to have have a sense of good and bad are there bad entities and good entities? Do they know what good and bad is? You know, that's part of our perception, really, because we live right. in, in, in duality. You know, we need good and bad in order to differentiate uh, things. But uh, I, I wouldn't use those terms in the non-physical. It's more the non-intelligent or the desperate or the those who don't know any better. I don't think there is a bad intention um, it's just a coincidence that there is a fit, you know, in certain cases. I'm not sure about other planetary, you know, inhabitants such as aliens. There's so many different types of entities out there that you would have to dissect every single one of them to see. Do they live in in a in a system that? is similar to ours where there is good and bad, so they carry that in their system, or uh, are they from outside duality and they don't even know what the hell good or bad is, they just are, you know? So that that needs to be determined. And what if they brought entities in with them that can get attached to us that are no good and then shape humanity as like parasites, you know? If an alien comes here with astral shit of its own in its own body because it didn't clean its chakras that morning, it had a fight with its wife or whatever, and then now it's got these entity attachments. Now they're set loose on the earth. It's like, man, I feel I feel so much better after going to earth. Yeah, man, because you dumped your garbage here, man. Thanks a lot. Right? Yeah. 
just but, interesting, man. Yeah. The whole thing, the tapestry is just fascinating when you really see it. It is. It is. But again, you know, we're multidimensional beings and and the part that is perceiving here, you know, it's just a tiny part of our greater self. So there's other parts of us that, that are incarnated in other places and not, they might be causing havoc, you know. Um, the other Brandon might be evil, you know, and might be out there. This is what I'm saying. I kind of like, and, yeah. I, I've thought about this. I'm like, well, what kind of asshole version of me is out here that made me got stuck in this prison or this demiurge thought it'd be a good idea to make me reform over a certain number of lifetimes? Like, what did I do? You know what I mean? And it's kind of one of those things that you're in a, you're like, let's say your partner gets mad at you and she's just like, Meh. and you're just like, what did I, you know, what's wrong? What's going on? Meh. And they don't tell you, right? But you're automatically being punished. And so therefore your mind's going like, well, what did I do? Am I not good enough? Is there even a God? Like, are we in a prison planet? You start getting all this because you don't get feedback. And so you start, it's, it's a mind fuck, man. It's very interesting. Yeah. But I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of it anytime soon. I agree. Soon. I, I agree. And that's why conversations like this, things like this are uh, beautiful and ever going. You know, that's why the name is Expanding Reality, right? We're just still doing it. We're just going to keep keep expanding here. Oliver, this has been awesome, man. I really appreciate you. It's really yeah. cool. Well, thank really you. Cool. Likewise, I, I, Dito, I, I enjoyed this talk. That was great. Yeah. yeah. But let's come to an end. I think uh, Brendan's going to run. He has another date in a few minutes. Um, yeah, like Brendan said, it was awesome. Really enjoyed talking to you, Oliver. And yeah, let's repeat that. Yeah. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, please stay with us for two more minutes, okay? Okay.